today is really around the science. So I'm very excited to hear the next uh, set of talks. For this session, we're going to have um, four 15 minute talks. Again, uh, the longer versions will be online uh, if you're interested to watch them. Um, and we will hold all the questions to the end. Um, and if you have questions, please feel free to ask them as as the speakers are talking, throw them in the Q&A or the chat or the Slack channel. Um, and we will wrap back around um, with any remaining time at the end. Um, and for the speakers, I will turn off my video and try to turn it back on about two minutes at your two minute warning. So you can kind of time see when you when you're running out. OK, so for our first speaker, um, we are going to have Dr. Ortega, who's going to talk about phytoplankton blooms and productivity inferred from BGC Argo bio optical sensors. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, okay. So my name is Leonel Ortega. I'm a scientist at the Cooperative Agreement with USRA. And today I want to talk about some work that I did mostly during my time at Princeton under the SOCOM project, looking at understanding phytoplankton blooms and estimating marine primary production using the bio-optical information that we get from the BGC Argo floats. So the plan for today is to summarize two talks or two projects that share the common idea of trying to estimate phytoplankton division rates using the bio-optical information coming from the floats. The first study is a bloom study and that was motivated by the analysis that Mike Berfield has been doing using satellite observations, in particular, space-based LIGO. So here on the left, we have phytoplankton seasonal bloom dynamics for the South Polar Sun. In the bottom panel, in the blue line, we have the phytoplankton division rate, which is driven by the availability of nutrients and light. In the upper panel for now, let's just focus on the black line, which is, which is the net biomass accumulation rate of change. So whenever that black line is positive, that means that we have phytoplankton biomass accumulation. And whenever the black line is negative, we have biomass decline. And the main takeaway from that study is that there seems to be a seasonal decoupling between the phytoplankton division rate and the actual biomass accumulation rate, where the peak in the phytoplankton division rate is about three months later than the actual peak in the biomass accumulation rate. Particularly interesting is that at the moment of the division rate's peak, which is supposed to be the time of the year when we have the most combination of optimal nutrients and light, At that moment, we shift in the phase of the accumulation rate where biomass stops accumulating and it starts declining. And uh, if you're thinking, or if you're used to thinking about mock drivers of the bloom, this might seem, and this actually was a bit of a puzzling result. And the way that it is understood is that we need to invoke top down processes, loss processes in order to understand the seasonal dynamics of the bloom. So it's not enough to just understand changes in the phytoplankton division rate. It's not enough to just understand changes in bottom-up drivers, such as the availability of nutrient and light. If we want to predict and understand things like bloom initiation, bloom termination, and possibly to project future changes in the seasonality of the bloom. The second project that I want to talk about is more directly focused on estimating vertically resolved primary production using the information coming from the flows. And here, I just want to take the opportunity that the flows are giving us vertically resolved biomass profiles, uh, which is something that is really hard for the satellites to do. And then with this type of, oh, it's just that I'm having connection problems. Hopefully you can still hear me well. Um, yeah, with the vertically resolved information, we can complement earlier productivity studies coming from satellites. And the level of full dimension view of productivity in the global ocean. The model that I use in both of these studies is this carbon based productivity model, uh, which has, it is based on the main idea of using changes in the phytoplankton chlorophyll to carbon ratio to parameterize phytoplankton division rates. And this comes very handy to us because both phytoplankton chlorophyll and carbon are variables that we can relatively easily infer from the bio-optical information coming from the floats. 
So in terms of light, the phytoplankton chlorophyll ratios shows a decreasing exponential function, where as we go into lower light levels, phytoplankton increases its cellular quota of chlorophyll to cope with the lack of light. And we see that behavior both in laboratory experiments and in satellite-based observations of the chlorophyll to carbon ratio. On the bottom panel, I'm showing you that relationship between the chlorophyll to carbon ratio and light for different ocean regions with different nutrient conditions, which is each of the black lines. The uppermost blue line is supposed to represent the theoretical maximum chlorophyll to carbon ratio that is achieved under optimal nutrient replete conditions. So in a very simple way, the way in which the model works is that it follows this exponential. Uh, somewhere is requesting to annotate the shared content, sorry. So I guess approve. Okay, to approve. I'm not sure what it is. Can you're, you all still see my slide? You're fine, Leonel. You're good. Okay, 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 let's go. So I was saying that the main way in which the model works is that it follows this decreasing exponential function to tell you something about the relationship. Now it does my cursor. Oh, now I can do this? I didn't set this, but it's actually pretty useful. So it follows the decreasing exponential function to tell you something about the light effect on the chlorophyll to cover ratio. And it follows this vertical distance between the theoretical maximum chlorophyll to cover ratio and each of the black lines to tell you something about the nutrient effect on the chlorophyll to cover ratio. So that is uh, a very general way. So now I cannot go through the slides. Let's see. Yeah. So that is in very simple terms, the way in which the model works. I go into more details in the curated talk online. And also if you want to know more about it, these are the two papers that you need to read. The one on the left deals with the general idea of developing the model and developing the idea of using changes in the chlorophyll to carbon ratio to parameterize division rates. The one on the right is already trying to use surface information coming from the satellites to give us vertically resolved estimates of phytoplankton biomass and productivity and division rates. So in a way, what I have done is simplify the model on the right because I no longer have to worry about predicting the vertical structure of biomass because I get that information of the floats from the floats. And all I need to worry about is that the parameterization of phytoplankton division rates and primary production is accurate enough and apply that to the data from the flow. So the first science highlight is from this paper focus on seasonal modulation of phytoplankton biomass in the surface ocean, in the southern ocean. Here I estimate the net biomass accumulation rate of change using the information coming directly from the floats. So the biomass information coming from the bio-optical instruments on the floats. The phytoplankton division rate is modeled using the CBPM, biomass information coming from the floats, and surface radius information coming from satellites. And that is the one point where we're still uh, dependent on satellite information because the second flows that I use do not have irradiant sensors. And then one can also estimate the loss rate as the difference between the, the accumulation rate and the phytoplankton division rate. So this is the main figure from that paper. I'm showing you seasonal bloom dynamics. On the left y-axis, we have the phytoplankton division rate, which is the red line. On the right y-axis, we have the net biomass rate of change or the accumulation rate, which is the blue line Remember, whenever the blue line is positive, that means that we have biomass accumulation in the surface ocean. And whenever it is negative, that means that we have biomass decline. The main takeaway at first impression is that we still see that time lag between the peak in the phytoplankton division rate and the peak in the biomass accumulation rate of about three months, which is the same thing that we saw from the satellite record. There's a few other things that we can take away from this seasonal cycle. The first one is that there is some kind of inflection point at the beginning of the winter where the biomass starts to decline at a slower rate, even though division rates are still going down. 
So let's try to understand this a little bit better. We're following the blue line, which is in the negative. That means that we are losing phytoplankton biomass. At the beginning of winter, this blue line starts going up, but it's still in the negative. That means that we're still losing phytoplankton biomass, but at a slower rate. However, that happens where phytoplankton division rates or phytoplankton growth is still declining. So the only way we can understand that right now is following the dilution hypothesis, which says that during winter, we have, we're experiencing a dilution of the upper phytoplankton community, or a, we, we have a deepening of the upper ocean mixed layer, which is causing a dilution of the phytoplankton community, reducing the encounter rate between phytoplankton and zooplankton, and therefore reducing the grazing pressure of zooplankton on phytoplankton. Then as we, go, as we go into the summer, we have a re-stratification of the upper mixed layer, which brings back the recoupling between phytoplankton and zooplankton and increases the grazing pressure of zooplankton on phytoplankton. And that's why, and that's how we can explain that at the moment of the year where we have the highest phytoplankton division rate, the highest phytoplankton growth, that's when we see a change or a shift in the phase of the biomass accumulation rate, as we saw in the satellite, and biomass it stops accumulating and it starts declining. And then we go back into the dilution phase and it, we go back to the beginning of the cycle. And that is what has been called the dilution recoupling hypothesis. So these in situ observations using the bioptical information coming from the floats has allowed us to confirm some of the patterns that we saw in the satellite record and some of the hypotheses or ideas coming from the Mike Bernfels uh, papers saying that we need to take into account top-down processes, loss processes, in order to understand the seasonal evolution of the bloom. And it's not enough to just understand changes in bottom-up drivers, such as availability of nutrients and light. So that slide that I just show um, is biased to the places where we have the where we have the highest float profile densities, and that is the subantarctic zone and the polar Antarctic zone. Here I'm showing you what happens at the two extremes. On the left, I'm showing you what happens for the floats located in the subtropical zone. So that is the more equator worse zone of the float array of the circumflot array. And here what we can see is a full decoupling between the phytoplankton division rate, the red line and the biomass accumulation rate, the blue line, where we see that the actual biomass accumulation happens when we have the lowest phytoplankton division rate. So here we're invoking again this dilution recoupling hypothesis. The idea is during the winter months, which are not really winters because we are in the tropics, we still have the mixing of the, of the mixed layer of the community and reducing the grazing pressure and that is the moment when, even though we have the lowest phytoplankton rates of the seasonal cycle at that place, we still see the blooming season at that moment because the top down of the top down down regulation of the grazing pressure on phytoplankton. On the right way axis, the main takeaway is that we were able to see that the bloom starts even when the surface ocean is still covered by ice. So all this period that is shown here in the shaded blue block is showing you the moments where the floats are taking information from below the ice. And even though we're in the middle of the winter and the ice is only furthering highlighting the light limitation of phytoplankton growth, those conditions seem to be harsh, but not harsh enough to prevent from phytoplankton from starting to bloom. And that's what we, that's the main takeaway that we have from these floats that are located on the other extreme in the Antarctic seasonal ice zone. Um, so now just a few results on the follow-up study that is more directly aiming at the quantification of vertically resolved primary production using information that's coming from the flows. Here and, and applied to the, to the same model, to the CBBM. So the sonal mean that we get from the flow profiles is shown in the middle. And I'm comparing that, that against EC2 C14 based observations. And this compilation in particular comes from the paper from Bodenhaus et al. in 2013. And we can see some very clear uh, similitudes between the EC2 observations and the BGC flow data. Um, highest vertically resolved primary production seems to occur at 
um, high latitudes, the lowest primary productivity is, seems to occur in the subtropics. And the surface area where we have the highest productivity seems to be constrained to about the surface, the top 50 meters of the water column, both in the in-situ observations and in the BGC float estimates. On the right, I'm showing you the difference between those two, specifically between float minus observations in milligrams of carbon per cubic meter per day. And you can see most of the difference are constrained between minus six and plus six milligrams of carbon per cubic meter per day although some places do show uh, a bit higher difference. We do have to keep in mind that these are not per measurements, so we wouldn't expect a perfect agreement between these compilation, historical compilation of in situ base C14 observations and the BGC flows. So the idea is to be able to catch some of the large scale spatial patterns as well as some of the seasonal patterns. So now that I have this vertically resolved information, I just wanted to see if there is something that I can learn from it. On the left, I'm showing you the vertically resolved nitrate concentration coming from the float. You can see there's not really much agreement or correlation between that and the just the productivity estimates coming from the float. In the middle panel, I'm showing you vertically cumulative NPP. That is, if we start integrating net primary production from the surface ocean towards depth, how much of that productivity has occurred at any given depth? So the scale of this plot is between zero and 100%. On the right, I'm showing you the vertical gradient in nitrate, whereas we go into more red colors, that means that the deep nitrate concentration is higher than the one on the surface. And just by looking at the two plots um, from afar, you can see there is a nice relationship between the meridional shift in the depth when we see the high red color and the meridional shift in this base of the primary production zone. And the places where we see the highest red color is kind of a, an proxy for the nitric line. Here, the black line is taken from the panel in the middle, and that's the place where already 90% of net primary production has occurred. And again, we see a nice correlation between the vertical meridional shift in the place where, let's call it the base of the productive layer is happening, and that's where we find the nitric line. These are really interesting result because this is an emergent property of the model. The CBPM is not informed, at least in the version that I'm using right now, is not informed by any nutrient information or nutrient concentration coming from the flows. So this gives some validity at this idea of using changes in the chlorophyll to carbon ratio to parameterize phytoplankton division rates and to obtain net primary production estimates vertically resolved in the water column. And if you want to understand and more of this idea of using the profit to show is a curated talk. And I also have more information there of how in situ observations of C14 uh, productivity compared with the float measurements. So now some conclusions for this short talk. We saw that there is a seasonal decoupling between phytoplankton division and accumulation rates. Uh, we saw that in the satellite record and that was confirmed from the in-situ based float observations. We saw that blooming events can occur in the periods of declining division rates, and bloom decline can occur during periods of high division rates, highlighting the importance of loss processes in detailing the evolution of the seasonal cycle in biomass. And using the information coming from under ice, we were also able to see that phytoplankton blooms start well before the ice begins to retreat. Related to the net primary production estimates, seasonal float base NPP agrees well with the patterns that we saw in the in-situ observations coming from C14 measurements. The difference between the float base and the observed NPP is mostly within 20%. So that is that six milligrams of carbon per cubic meter. That is within 20% of the maximum range in the system of variability. Remember again, that we're trying to just match general patterns. We're not hoping to, we're not hoping that these data set are gonna show you the same result because they are not taken at the same time. And again, the vertical extending water column productivity agree, agrees well with the meridional changes in the nitrocline depth, which is an emerging property of the productivity model, which is not informed by any information regarding nutrients in the water column. And that is all for now. And uh, thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you. Great. A little quick clap. So um, I was mistaken about the schedule. We're actually going to do a really quick question if, if there are any questions for each speaker. 
immediately after as we're kind of transitioning over because we have to wrap up by about one fit or about a quarter after the next hour. So we're going to start transitioning over to Cara Wilson. Um, but while she's doing that, is there any, feel free to raise your hand or just unmute yourself if you have um, a question. And Cara, you can go ahead and pull up your slides. Perfect. Any questions? Okay, great. Well, please watch the lo the longer talks. They're really great. Um, they're up on the website. And now we're going to tra transition over to fisheries. Um, and Cara Wilson's going to talk to us about applications of BGC Argo with fisheries and fisher fishery management. Great. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm Cara Wilson, and I'm from NOAA Fisheries in Monterey. Oops. Um, and today I'm going to talk about fisheries and fisheries management, and this is going to be a slightly different talk because it's not going to be so much on what's been done with, with BGC Argo data, but more the potential of what could be done with it. Um, this is a combination. My co-authors on here are Alistair Habde, Takatoshi Kodama, Srinivas Kumar, Patrick Lahore, Mike Seke, and Charles Stock. And these people were all co-authors in a, or all gave presentations in a session, um, a Go BGC workshop that was actually held last month. Um, and on this next slide here, we see actually all of the talks that they gave. So in addition to the curated talk of this talk um, that's available, all of these talks are available on the workshop website for that, which is the URL is given down at the bottom here. So there's more information about all of these subjects. Excuse me, I um, this is my curated talk and the timings are uh, um, in here, which I'm accidentally, anyways. Um, so all of these talks are available. I encourage you to look at them if you're if you're more interested. But I'm going to give a summary of basically everything that was discussed in that session um, in today's talk. So I'm going to start with what does fisheries mean? Outside of the fishing community, most people just think of fisheries and they think of people going out and catching fish. And the harvesting component is certainly a, a component of fisheries, but it's only one. Um, there are multiple. Ugh, Sorry about this, it can be annoying. Um, there are other aspects of fisheries, such as stock assessment, management and conservation. Underlying all of this is research. We still have a lot of research that have to go into all of these different aspects. Um, another important aspect is that fisheries, the reason I have it in quotes here, is that it's more than just fish. When we say fisheries, we're talking about all living marine resources, or LMRs as we call them. So that includes marine mammals, sea turtles, invertebrates, and keeping in mind a lot of these things are things that are not commercially harvested. Fundamental to all aspects of fisheries is, is knowledge of the relevant habitat. We have to understand where these animals are living, and then we want to the ability to forecast that into the future, whether that's short term for fishing or longer term for understanding how these, um, these species are going to change with climate change. So I'm going to talk about each of these aspects um, in turn. I'm going to start with talking about harvesting. Satellite data has been used um, a great deal to identify fishing grounds. What we're looking at here is an image of chlorophyll in the Pacific, and the cross marks overlaying on top of that show the distribution of the, terse, uh, the tuna per seine fishery in the Pacific. And so what you can see is that there's a very strong correlation between where um, where the fishers go to uh, harvest tuna and where there's higher chlorophyll. But it's also important to keep in mind that satellite data only gives you the surface conditions. And clearly, fisheries live at the fish live at depth. Um, and so having subsurface information like we will get from BioArgo will give us a much better understanding of their habitat, of where the fish are and where the, where the fish aren't. Um, particularly with oxygen, um, there's a lot of tuna species that are um, affected by hypoxia, which also occurs in this part of the Pacific. And so having the subsurface oxygen data will be really helpful in understand, better understanding fisheries. So as I mentioned, uh, satellite data has been used to identify fishing grounds, but most fishers don't have the skill set to consolidate satellite data or other sources of environmental data, such as that, that we'll be getting from the BGC Argo floats. Um, so an important question is, whose job is it to identify fishing grounds? And like most questions, the answer depends on who's asking it. There are international differences in how identifying fishing grounds is conducted. Here in the United States, it's actually commercial entities who supply this information to fishers. And the reason for that is that NOAA's National Marine Fishery Service, who I work for, is responsible for the stewardship of the nation's oceans research and their habitat. And so they're actually not allowed to aid fishers in harvesting. So in the United States, it happens on a commercial level, not by the government. In contrast, in India, 
the Indian National Center for Ocean Information Services, which is sort of um, similar to NIMPS in the United States, they do generate what they call pot potential fishing zone information that they generate from satellite data and that they distribute to its fishers. And next, I'll just show a little, um, little example of that. This is an example of the PFCs that INCOIS makes and distributes to their fishers. And basically, they've taken that satellite data. You can see it, they've really consolidated it down. All of these little squiggles here on the map are basically areas that, you know, su that they suggest are good places to fish um, according to satellite data. Uh, they also consolidate this into distance from shore, uh, direction that you would go from port. And because there's so many languages in India, they distribute this in um, a variety of different languages to their, to their fishermen. Next, let's talk about stock assessment. And this slide is my little joke here. Um, if you're not in the, in the fishery community and you talk about stock assessment, people think you're talking about um, the stocks in Wall Street. Just to be clear, I'm not talking about the stocks in Wall Street, but just like stock assessment in fisheries, where we're talking about fish biomass, um, it's similar to what we want to do on what, what's done in the stock market, where basically we want to try to um, predict future, um, future predict trends based on current conditions and past performance. So, that's what stock assessment is about in a nutshell. This is an example of, of a fish stock assessment for the Atlantic herring and the um, um, and what is showing is the spawning stock biomass. You can see almost 60 year record of it. You can see very large interannual vari variability in the biomass. Um, currently, the target population is below um, the, the target level where we'd like it. So it's basically an, um, an overfish species and there are, a rebuilding plan has been put in place. What's interesting about the current stock assessments um, and NOAA Fisheries has about three or 400 of these stock assessments that they create every year is that um, very little, if any, interannual um, environmental data actually goes into these stock assessments. But we know that environmental data really drives fisheries. Um, and a lot of the reason why we don't have this environmental data in these stock assessments is actually a, a lack of data. And so that's that's somewhere where the, the data from BioArgo could really come in useful. Next, I'm going to talk a little bit about management and conservation for fisheries. Note the little Argo floats on this um, on this uh, artist panel here. So, as I just mentioned, with a traditional stock assessment, it um, doesn't generally take into account the environment, but we know that not only does the environment play a role, um, but there's a lot of other factors that, that come into effect for um, looking at, at one species of um, biomass. There can be prey predator relationships, there's environmental impacts. And so we're moving towards an ecosystem based management that takes all of these things into account. Um, to create an integrated ecosystem assessment. And it's really crucial when we're making these sort of assessments to have to have a lot of data. And particularly we need we need subsurface data. So that's where I really the data from BioArgo I think will be very valuable as we're moving towards these ecosystem-based management approaches. Um, some examples of uh, conservation efforts that are being that are being done. Uh, there's a program called Turtle Watch, which is run out of the Pacific Islands Fishery Science Center. And what it's trying to do is mitigate turtle bycatch. Bycatch is a really big issue in fisheries, and by bycatch is basically when um, there is the incidental catch of other fish or um, living marine resources in a fishery. And in the Pacific, there is a, a lot of the fisheries out here are, are shut down if they catch too many turtles in their um, when they're when they're catching fish. And so what they have what we've done is develop this satellite-based SST um, index to indicate where we think the turtles will be. And so this is an area, the red band here is basically um, a warning that's given out to fishers of not to fish here because there's a higher likelihood that they'll interact with turtles and then the, 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 the fishery will have to be shut down. Um, briefly next, I'm gonna look at a little bit of some research uh, of BioGeo uh, using biogeochemical bio argo data that's relevant to fisheries. So it's been mentioned earlier, Ken mentioned this, that via argo data is a really nice complement to satellite data. Uh, this is a uh, work that was done a couple of years ago in the Indian Ocean, and what they were looking at is they they have a number of blooms of Noctiluca that have uh, been occurring more frequently in the Indian, Indian Ocean, and it had been hypothesized that these blooms were were being driven by hypoxia. So what these authors did is they used 
satellite data to identify areas uh, where there's an octaluca bloom, and then they use bioargo data to look subsurface to look at the oxygen conditions during those noctiluca blooms. And basically, they found that these uh, noctiluca, noctiluca blooms were not associated with hypoxia. Um, one of the things we can get from, from bioargo data uh, is subsurface chlorophyll maximum, which is really neat. Um, we all know we, can, we have great images of satellite data, of satellite chlorophyll data, but we can't see the, the chlorophyll maximum. Um, so this is a paper looking at the subsurface chlorophyll maximum in a, different, a number of different oligotrophic environments and looking at the seasonal distribution of it. Some of the work that I've been doing is looking at um, blooms, chlorophyll blooms that develop in the summertime in the North Pacific. You can see the area where they developed right down here, that circled area. Um, the image here is showing a bloom from a couple of years ago. There are these pretty large, dramatic blooms that develop. Um, we don't really know why. Uh, we're pretty sure that there's new the subsurface injections of nutrients, but um, there's really been no, never any direct evidence of that. Um, so once I discovered that there was bioargo data, it's important for me to note here that I'm I have not been involved at, at all in any of the, um, you know, the programs or the sensors. I'm just a a user who stumbled across this data and thought it was pretty cool and exciting and started working with it. So um, I'm one of those users that Ken hopes we get a lot more of uh, people to find the data and find it useful. Um, but anyways, I was interested to see if we could find any of these subsurface uh, um, nitrate injections that would lead to a chlorophyll bloom. And using the data from um, some of the floats around Hawaii, I found this nitrate injection here. This is nitrate, and you can see there's like this two-month-long injection. And then the maps we're seeing here on the right are basically um, right above this injection um, a few weeks later. Anyway, you can see a, a chlorophyll bloom did indeed develop around these uh, injections. The red floats, um, the red points here are basically the uh, location of the nitrogen injection that we're seeing over here on the left. Um, so then just lastly, um, this you know, a version of this has been shown before. This is showing the, the float array now. Uh, only about 10% of these floats now have the, the biogeochemical floats. Um, when, this, when, when this number increases, um, hopefully we'll have more, um, we'll be able to have more global views of um, projects like this. The ones that I showed were all really sort of regional projects, we really haven't been able to have kind of a global view because uh, our sparsity of the floats at the, at the moment is, um, is too sparse. Um, this is just making that point with oxygen. This is showing the number of observations in the World Ocean Atlas um, of profiles of, you know, so not, not by orbit floats. Um, the red and the yellow, since this is a log, a log scale, is showing basically areas where there's, um, there's less than 10 profiles ever, and there's a lot of areas where there's none. So um, the data from BioGeo Argo will hopefully um, change, ch radically change this, this um, map. In the in the coming years, which is very exciting. So, shortly from uh, just to wrap up from my take home messages, fisheries management involves characterizing habitat and trying to forecast it into the future, and it's really crucial to have oceanographic measurements enabled to be able to do this. Currently, subsurface information is sparse or lacking, particularly for biological and chemical observations, and the data from the BGC Argo floats will provide key ecosystem measurements that cannot be obtained from satellites such as oxygen, nitrate, and pH. So um, thank you. I want to thank the organizers for um, asking for inviting me to give this talk. I encourage you to watch the Curiage talk, and more importantly, I encourage you to go out there and get your hands on some of this data and um, have fun with it. Great, thank, thank you. you. Um, okay, so we have time for one quick question. I think as we're turning over, if Kara, if you want to stop sharing your screen, yep. and next up is Seth Bushensky. If you want to go ahead and start sharing, are there any questions? Don't be shy. Everyone shy. <laughs> I guess, yeah, I have one question for you. So you said that this, you know, 10% that we're at right now is is not enough. We're kind of targeting more like 30% of the Argo array will be carrying the biogeochemical sensors. As a fisheries specialist, what do you think about that number? Um, well, I mean, I, I think it's not so much the number. I mean, I think a lot of it is really, as was touched on earlier, I think Lynn was talking about in her talk of, you know, getting to those those key areas. Um, so for, I, did, I didn't touch on this talk, but in the Curry did talk, um, I, I go into the details of the, the tuna fishery in the Pacific that is um, uh, 
impacted by the hypoxic area. And so that would be something that would be really, you know, we, we would want floats to be able to, to measure, measure that area. So it's not so much about the numbers, but making sure that it gets, gets the right um, areas. I guess. Cool. Great. Thank you. Sure. Um, so we're going to transition over to our next speaker, who is Seth Bashensky, who's going to talk about how biogeochemical floats, pH, and derived carbon products are changing our understanding of the carbon cycle. Thanks, Sarah, uh, and thanks for having me here to talk today. Uh, I was asked to talk, as my title says, about pH and derived carbon products. So I'm going to uh, try and give a brief overview of the published literature that has used these data from the floats. Um, thankfully, we've had a lot of background about the float technology and whatnot, so uh, I can skip all that, although feel free to take a look at the longer talk online. So I'm focusing today on the Southern Ocean carbon cycle because that's where most of the work has been done, thanks to SOCOM and the uh, deployed floats here. So when we think about the Southern Ocean carbon cycle and the air-sea fluxes, um, I'd like to use this nice diagram from Gruber et al. 2019 that shows our contemporary CO2 flux as a combination of anthropogenic and natural carbon cycles. And so on the left hand uh, side here, we have the anthropogenic CO2, which is really just the large scale anthropogenic increase in atmospheric CO2 that's overlaid on top of everything. And so overall, that tends to push carbon into the ocean. And that is on top of this natural carbon cycle uh, that is comprised of subtropical water moving south and cooling. It also has a lot of biological production occurring. And this both they both draw down the PCO2 and uh, cause uptake of carbon into the ocean. That's balanced by this upwelled signature from deep waters that is reaching the surface. It's enriched in old carbon uh, from respired organic matter. And so that outgassing, those two combine to give us a roughly balanced natural flux. And so most of our contemporary carbon uptake up around one petagram of carbon per year is this anthropogenic signal. And overall, we think we know the anthropogenic carbon cycle uh, better based on interior carbon measurements. Um, and so this natural flux is, is less certain. Now, this is really based on surface CO2 data. So the SOCAT project compiles all of the thousands and thousands of hours of hard work from shipboard underway measurements. Um, this is a, these are a couple of figures from Bacadal 2016 that shows um, both the successes and the challenges of the underway um, measurements. So this is January, February, March data from the 2000s shown in the upper figure here and uh, July, August, September data from the 2000s in the bottom. And so in the Northern Hemisphere summer, we have an awful lot of measurements uh, throughout the year. Uh, in the winter, there's fewer, but there, there's still a fair amount. But in the Southern Hemisphere, we're, we're really lacking. Even in the, the Austral summer, we have uh, lots of large areas with very few measurements. And in the winter, we really only have a couple places in the ocean that are sampled frequently. So float data come in in that the floats are out. They, they uh, sample throughout the year. And so this is now um, uh, just looking at a four-year chunk from the early SOCOM period, comparing shipboard observations from 2014 to 17 to float observations. And this is uh, the number of months throughout the year that are sampled, so in a representative um, year. So 12 is the maximum. Shipboard observations in Drake Passage around New Zealand and Tasmania reach a full annual cycle. But most places in the ocean only see ship board observations maybe one month out of the year, certainly not full annual cycle. Uh, where we see um, floats, they have a much, uh, we have a better distribution of full annual cycles in the open ocean. And so that starts to give us a really new perspective on the seasonal cycles of uh, surface CO2 fluxes and surface biogeochemistry. So this is uh, one of the first papers that was published looking at CO2 fluxes from the floats. This is from Allison Gray and co-authors, published in 2018. And in this plot here, I have, uh, there are five different zones of the Southern Ocean. So going from the North to the South, uh, the zone that we'll really focus on here is this Antarctic Southern zone um, where the floats, 
the annual mean estimate in this dark color here is really showing much stronger outgassing than previous estimates based on Takahashi climatology or the global carbon budget. And so uh, this is primarily due, a win due to a wintertime outgassing. Um, and overall, this implies very little Southern Ocean uptake. So instead of that minus one petagram of carbon per year, we're talking about maybe minus 0.1 petagrams of carbon per year. So a pretty big difference. Um, and this expanded on some initial uh, results from Nancy Williams in 2017 that showed high polar Antarctic zone delta PCO2 from a handful of flows. So this is one of the this is the paper that initially told us how to get PCO2 estimates from flow measurements of pH. And so this, this really disagrees with prior ship-based work from pri primarily summertime observations. And so we set out to try and reconcile these two approaches. So we combined ship and float observations using two mapping methods. One is the Lanschutz et al. neural network, and the second was Rodenbeck et al. carbo scope mixed layer interpolation scheme. And these are just two different ways of taking the sparse surface data that we have and trying to fill in spatial and temporal gaps in PCO2. And so we tested three different PCO2 products. One, ship only. This is essentially what has been used um, elsewhere. One, combined ship and float, where we tried to uh, merge the float data in a, a thoughtful way to get a combined product that used the best of both worlds. And then finally, a float weighted um, data set that was somewhat of a sensitivity analysis to try and see what would happen if we uh, push things towards the float data. Um, we find similar results to what Allison showed in that when you add in the float data, this is now showing the neural network uh, air CCO2 fluxes in an annual mean uh, neural network on the top, in a cover scope on the bottom. When you add in the float data, you see an outgassing uh, that's centered around the polar front, primarily due to wintertime outgassing. Um, it's a bit stronger in the cover scope, mixed layer interpolation scheme than in the, the uh, neural network, um, which is one indication of why it's good to use multiple mapping methods uh, regardless of, of what approach you're taking. Um, when we look at this in the mean annual uh, sense, these two colored lines down here are the sort of ship plus float uh, pre-SOCOM estimates. And then here, this black triangle represents our, our best estimate of the Southern Ocean uptake of 0.75 petagrams carbon per year. And so to uh, put that in context then, this means that if our contemporary flux is about 0.75 petagrams of carbon per year, and we have good confidence in the anthropogenic flux, then our natural Southern Ocean flux is about 0.4 petagrams of carbon per year. And that's consistent with some other recent studies um, that found a, a similar adjustment using different methods. Um, and I should note that this is ongoing work that a lot of groups are, are comparing these results with different methods and, and different approaches. Um, so uh, Adrian Sutton and co-authors published uh, work that looked at some uh, particular floats uh, and uh, using a sail drone equipped with PCO2 uh, measurement capability. So that's really exciting stuff. And then Neil McKay uh, just published a study that was looking at synthetic profiles derived from uh, GLODAP from cruise-based measurements and trying to compare what they would expect in the wintertime to what we see from the floats, uh, which is a really interesting approach. Um, so lots more coming out in, in this field uh, over time. So looking now more at the seasonal DFAC dynamics, so the, the sort of surface cycles that inform this, these uh, CO2 fluxes, this is a paper back in 2017 by Nancy Williams, um, looking at the seasonal cycles from specific floats in the Southern Ocean. Uh, and so uh, here I have shown just float 9096, looking at delta DIC in black and delta total alkalinity in black here. Um, the main thing I want to point out is that there's this large, uh, so she did a, a flux decomposition with the different components of, of what goes into these terms and found that there's this large uh, turquoise line here. This is net community metabolism, essentially saying upwelled. Uh, or upwell respired organic uh, matter. So this is this is a signature of old water that's being brought to the surface. It's high in DIC, it's high in, in nutrients, it's low in oxygen. And so that net community metabolism then drives this large PCO2 signal. So this is just from one float, uh, I believe this was in the Atlantic, 
um, but it shows what we get by sampling in the winter time. We get these really high uh, PCO2 values, and you can start to understand what's driving these, and that's what's leading to this this increased outgassing that we're getting from the float data. Uh, so this is another example from Ellen Briggs of, of using um, the derived carbon products in a really nice way. So this is the first look at under ice observations from uh, Argo float. And this is just showing one uh, float here, 5904184. Um, we've got ice cover shown in these upper uh, figures and then sections of oxygen saturation, pH, derived DIC, and chlorophyll. And so the nice thing that you can see from these floats for the first time is under ice, we have this oxygen drawdown. These are our water column inventories. So oxygen drawdown, DIC return. This is evidence of respiration under ice. And then as soon as the ice melts or you know, pay close attention to Leonel's uh, talk and figures a little bit before the ice starts melting, um, you have this increase in oxygen and a nice decrease in DIC showing production. So this starts to illustrate some of the, the potential and the value of these data, and really we're, uh, we're just scratching the surface. Um, you've heard some about the uncertainties before. I, I do just want to make the point that you know this is an active research field. These PCO2 values are estimates; they're not measurements, and there's a lot that goes into it. So this is a really nice diagram from. Nancy Williams 2017 paper showing all of the different uncertainties that go into PCO2 of seawater. Um, and I, I cut it out of this short talk here, but you know, we are doing the surface comparisons between PCO2 and uh, floats, and, and it really everything looks good. So I'm not saying we have evidence of obvious biases, but you know, you use these data with caution, make sure you understand what uh, the uncertainties are and how they relate to your specific question. And overall, I think these are uh, these are just really exciting times because we're adding so much more uh, observational capability and we can start to ask questions that we really couldn't ask before. So this is a, a, a time and space sampling uh, diagram from a short review paper that I wrote with Yui Takashita and Nancy Williams a few years ago um, where we looked at what new observational capability was being added by autonomous platforms. And so this is just a nice way of demonstrating uh, we've got time on the y-axis, space on the x-axis. Both of these are approximately log scales. And these red boxes uh, highlight really what we could see prior to float data. So we have decadal hydrographic surveys, volunteer observing ships. Both of them get these large scale, uh, both in time and space questions um, but now that we are adding autonomous capability and specifically profiling floats in this black box here uh, with these plus symbols representing new observational capability, uh, we're expanding down. We have a lot smaller, finer scale observational capability to look at different questions. Uh, we're able to uh, extend our analyses down into higher frequency variability and start to look at uh, climate impacts, that sort of thing. Um, and, and so we're really we're able to answer different questions, not just these long term changes, but smaller scale, short term changes and add nuanced understanding to the long term changes as well. Um, just to try and uh, recap. So this is a, I like this diagram from Morrison and all 2015 illustrating just how complex the Southern Ocean is. Have upwelling of deep water. Some of that goes into mode water formation. Some of that goes into deep water formation. We have a lot of fronts and intersection of different water masses. And so I, I covered some of uh, what has been found in terms of air sea CO2 fluxes and uh, some of the seasonal cycles that are found here. Um, these are papers that have used a lot of information about the seasonal cycles. I think. In my longer talk, I talked a little about about Fay et al. 2018. I didn't have a chance here. Um, and then also getting into biogeochemical responses to physics. Lisa Rosso had a paper in 2020 uh, that in part looked at that. And I, I only focused on published work uh, for this talk, but there's just a ton of really interesting, really nice work coming out. If you're at the SOCOM annual meeting, you got a preview of a lot of that. Uh, so we're going to see some great stuff coming out, um, not just in terms of these large scale. Uh, fluxes and cycles, but really what's driving, uh, what are the mechanisms? 
Um, and then in, in considering how to link uh, the different regional variability and, and especially coastal and open ocean, uh, UE's got some nice uh, pH measurements on gliders going. And uh, like I said, there's PCO2 on um, surface vehicles. So thanks for uh, listening. I, other people were, were um, discussing it, so I, I didn't go into any of the measuring and, and correcting validating pH or uncertainties, but there's a whole lot of great work there. Uh, thanks to the funding agencies who funded all of these different uh, projects. SOCAT for all of the shipboard work, which, you know, the, these float data are great. They, they add to what we have, but uh, they're, they're not going to replace the shipboard data that we need and that underpins everything here. Uh, and thanks to SOCOM for the pilot and uh, go BGC for inviting me here today. Great. Thank you, Seth. Um, that was a great overview of some really interesting work. Um, while we're switching over, next up is Matt Mazoff. If you want to pull up your slides, we have time for one quick question. Does anybody have a question for Seth? in the chat, or you can just unmute yourself. Hey, Sarah, okay. in here. Yeah. A quick, quick comment for Seth, and it's kind of a comment, but something we ought to explore, but Steve Reiser, uh, gave a great talk where so, so I'm thinking of your diagrams, uh, space and time and, and the areas accessible by different platforms. Uh, Steve has this really interesting talk that he gave where he points out how Argo, you know, which we think of as that sort of seasonal to to hundreds of kilometer scale actually, is, you know, Sarah Gilly did things like diel cycles and people study hurricanes and and, you know, it, by having an array that is uniform and samples all over the place, you can actually access many, many different kinds of things. And I think that's something we should keep in mind. Yeah, where, where to draw those boundaries is something that we spent a lot of time arguing over. And uh, as you pointed out and, and uh, published recently, that there are definitely um, some really interesting things to find as we as we have enough data. So, you know, some of that is dependent on on array density and frequency of sampling. Yeah. But yeah, like I said, you're, we're able to ask questions we never even uh, could. Um, or we're able to answer questions we never could even ask before. So yeah, uh, interesting. So. group have a nice paper out looking at floats, uh, BGC floats and eddies, and the, and the enhancement of properties just because floats randomly sample eddies. And pretty soon, right. if you have enough data, you start to talk about the statistics of profiles in eddies versus not, and cyclonic and anticyclonic. So anyway, just you know, yeah, encouraging people to think outside that square box you have. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, so we're going to move on to our last talk of this uh, of today of day one. Um, Matt Mazoff is going to talk to us about Go BGC for modeling and assimilation. Thank you, Sarah. My name is Matt Mazloff. I'm going to talk about Go BGC and modeling. And uh, <clears throat> Ken's comment really ties in to my talk because models are a way to synthesize, synthesize the whole observing system and to extract information in space and time. And um, however, uh, the models, you know, fairly useless without observations. We need modelers, and I wrote desperately need Go BGC because the modeling efforts are underway and, and they need this, need this for validation and tuning and to make mapping products and reanalyses um, or to initialize forecasts and projections. Modeling efforts, uh, you know, model is a hypothesis of, of what the ocean state is and how the ocean state evolves. And you can only test your hypothesis with data. And so GoBGC provides that data. And when we find that we can't bring a model into consistency with that data, then we know there's something to, about the system we need to learn. We need to further understand. And that's where the, the science can, can come in. Uh, I have a longer version of this as the other people do. I will go really quick because I know we're late, but um, um, so physical uh, reanalyses are, ocean physical reanalyses are in underway. There's many of them and they have really become skillful in the last few years, thanks to Core Argo providing observations and thanks to uh, figuring out how to, to use them. So here's a recent paper from Carden et al. Showing that several physical ocean reanalyses are 
have uncertainties or misfits to data within a degree Celsius. Um, well, likewise, there are many BGC modeling and forecasting efforts underway. And here's a, a table from uh, Fennel et al. Uh, that describes many of these efforts. And these are international efforts. As Kara mentioned, there was a workshop uh, a few weeks ago uh, about, or last month, about uh, Go BGC. And uh, there were some talks there talking about how important Argo has been to the efforts uh, and anticipating how important BGC Argo will be and saying that they're already using BGC Argo in these centers to help tune and for assimilation. This is an example from the Copernicus uh, Marine Service a presentation by PRX uh, saying that they are doing BGC forecasting and they are providing these, these uh, products and they need the data. It's the main source of in situ observations for their reanalysis and their forecasts. Um, I like this slide. This was also from the, that uh, workshop. It was by Jim Piero Cosarini showing how their forecast skill on day one improves when you add data. More data leads to better forecasts because more data lets you initialize your forecast closer to the true ocean. And there wasn't, it's not just Europe, here's uh, efforts going on tuning uh, BGC models with data and, and uh, it, out of Jamstack, efforts from NASA ECHO, going quick. Um, but yeah, there's great presentations there. So you know, check out some of what's going on in a lot of these modeling centers. There's been a lot of uh, talk about potential predictab predictability. We wanna be able to forecast the ocean. We wanna know what's happening. And these models have shown that there may be strong and long predictability of many biogeochemical properties. Uh, here's a paper by Cromhart, Proliker, um, talking about pr potential predictability. predictability. However, the caveat, as, as stated in the Froelicher paper, is that they're assuming that they have a perfect model and they're assuming that they have nearly perfect initial conditions. Um, and we know we don't have perfect models and we know we don't have nearly perfect initial conditions, but with enough data, we can improve our models and we can get nearly perfect models. We can figure out where we're, we're going wrong and, um, and with observations, we can, we can uh, get those initial conditions. We can use this uh, data simulation to get the initial conditions. Um, however, yeah, without GoBGC, there's, <laughs> there'll be no improvement. So, it's exciting that this is happening. Um, now you, people are starting to put BGC models in with their physical models and their physical assimilation. And here's a paper by Park et al. in, in 2018 that they showed that they were doing worse. They were, for, we were less consistent with the BGC data in the tropics when they did physical data simulation. Uh, so, we even more recently, Gasparin et al. looking at a different operational uh, setup. So the first one is GFDL um, using ensemble, ensemble common filter. The this one is the the one on the right is the Mercator Ocean Operational 3D VAR system. They also found the same thing that they were doing worse with their nitrate property distribution compared to data when they uh, assimilated physics. So why is that? Well, when we do data assimilation. We're looking at our background guess, our first guess, and we're comparing that to the data, and we're mapping those misfits back to the solution. So we're finding a, a solution that's more consistent with the data. How you do that mapping depends on your method, whether it's objective mapping or 3D VAR, where you're using statistical inferences, or ensemble common filter, where you're projecting through models, solutions, or 4D VAR, or machine learning. Whatever you're using to do this mapping, you have to project the model data misfit, your background data misfit onto your, your model solution. Uh, when you hear that physical assimilation is hurting biogeochemistry uh, properties or vice versa, this means that we're doing something wrong. It's not that the, the ocean is wrong. <laughs> it's not like the measurements are wrong. We're mapping them wrong. And it's an opportunity to improve our data simulation and what's really powerful is when you when you hear that they're simulating temperature and salinity and it's making the fit to nitrate wrong that often means you're not assimilating temperature and salinity correctly and you can improve the physical reanalyses and the physical forecasts by assimilating biogeochemistry 
It also could be that you just aren't underestimating or overestimating the uncertainty in the data or the model. And that also is useful. I mean, this is when you look at this, there, it just means there's great opportunity for method and model development. So Go BGC is going to tell us, well, we, we put in BGC, we did worse here. And I, I picked on those two, those two uh, operational centers, but I mean, I've done this myself. This, ha this happens commonly. BGC shows where you have, say, unphysical upwelling, and that's going to give you also unphysical upper ocean heat content, and you're going to have worse just physical forecasts. And the reason why this is it's so powerful is because it has different gradients than the physical variables. It has um, often stronger gradients, and so this is a, a line, a go ship line along 150 west in the tropics, showing the temperature, salinity, oxygen, and carbon. And what you'll really notice is the dynamic range in oxygen is huge. We have values of 250 at the surface. We have values of uh, zero <laughs> at, at intermediate depths. And so if you have any spurious vertical exchange, you're gonna notice it in oxygen before you notice it in other fields. So it has strong gradients and they're in different locations in the water column, which can really inform model error and really amplify signals. Uh, I wanna be really quick, so I'll just, say that we're looking to estimate what the ocean state is. We want a perfect initial condition. And you only can do that if you have adequate data coverage. So when we do this kind of assimilation, we're looking at what is our cost function? How, how, what are we trying to optimize? And you could say, well, I think uh, this is what the ocean state is. And someone else could say, I think this is what the ocean state is. And if you compare the data and you're both equal, and you're both around the same distance from the data, then they're both equally likely solutions. And if they're very different, that means the ocean is poorly constrained and things are really uncertain. And as um, Seth said, you know, mapping me comparing mapping methods is important, especially for biogeochemistry, because we're at a place where we can start to see there are misfits and where they are, but it's hard to know what the right answer is because they're, they're, our cost function is like a nice big U. But if you have a lot of observations, that cost function becomes more like a V and it's clear what the right answer is and it's clear what the ocean is doing. And go be, and just like Argo has really helped us constrain temperature and salinity in the ocean and know what the actual heat content is of the ocean, GOBGC will begin to constrain or will constrain the carbon content of the ocean. And so in, in this paper by uh, Ariane Verdi and myself, we, did an ensemble of uh, model runs and we compared them to SOCAD and we looked at how likely they may have been and you can come up with kind of an uncertainty estimate. It's still fairly large. So when you look at say uh, our estimate of carbon flux versus another product, there are big differences there, but some of that is because it's, we're not yet fully constrained. Um, and this is all changing with GOBGC. So, to conclude, and I'm sorry that we're now three minutes over time, but um, modeling efforts really need GoBGC because it's going to allow us to improve all aspects of our modeling uh, endeavors. And uh, yeah, and it'll allow us to validate and tune our models, make more accurate map products, understand what the uncertainty is of these products, uh, and, and they'd be able to initialize forecasts and, and make projections for societal benefits. Thanks. Great, thank you, Matt. Um, any questions from, from the audience? Go ahead and unmute yourself or throw a question in the chat. Nothing in the chat or Q&A. Great, I guess, Matt, I have one question. You got to talk a, a bunch about what uh, the data will do for models. Um, can you say anything about what models could do for our observing system and how to plan where to put these floats? Yeah, so in the longer talk, I do talk about Aussies and, and the value that they can show. Um, they can tell you where to help, they can help design where to put the floats. They can show you how much impact they will have. Um, I think the most exciting uh, aspect, and I, I, I don't know how well the models are now enough to to have this capability but the most exciting aspect to me is that i really emphasize that we need to hold the models accountable to the data but we can also compare as the models get more skillful we can hold the data accountable to the models and we can look well how far 
we can come up with uncertainty estimates of our model and we can look how far the data is from the model and we can use that to help semi-automate QC or, or to help inform uh, float health. So I, I think it can be used for design, um, where to put the floats and, and, and with effort it can be used in the QC process. Thank you. Uh, Ken, go ahead. Yeah, a, a quick question. So, uh, have, having more data, it seems clear, you know, BGC, Argo is clearly important, but how important is it that the model skill be good? So, if I, if the model has significant biases and I put more data into it, do I still benefit or do I just create biases? Uh, well, it depends. Yeah, that's, <laughs> uh, that's a good question, but I, I think really we don't want to ever as you know everything here is a moving target and you know like your sensors are as well um we don't want to uh stop developing the model and so yes you put the you put the data in you see that you're always go drifting away from the data in one direction you don't just sit there and, and say oh well my forecast is going to be bad you try to figure out what what missing physics in your model is driving in that one direction and so with enough data, you can correct your models rapidly because you can see these drifts exactly where they're beginning and where they're starting. When you don't have much data, uh, you may not notice the, the causal mechanism of the model drift. So I think uh, that we need the data to, to correct the model drift and then the forecast skill will come from the, the, uh, both the improved model and the improved initial condition estimate. Great, great, great. Thank you. Very helpful. Great. There are um, questions in the Q&A as well as in the chat now. Uh, great. Thank you. Uh, Eric, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Is this about improving BGC parameterizations? Is this the question? I'm sorry. Modeling, my mute keeps turning off. Uh, GoBTC um, modeling can help us focus where, you know, where to focus our efforts on measurement and certainty analysis. In other words, you know, prioritizing which measure for which measurements uncertainty analysis is most important. I was just curious if the speaker had any perspectives on that or opinions. I didn't quite understand what. Um... Well, when you assimilate data, data is assimilated not only with the value that's measured, but also with an uncertainty. And we right. previously discussed today that those uncertainties weren't well known. So, in other words, then you have an effort to determine those uncertainties, and then you want to prioritize that effort. And I'm thinking that modeling the gain matrices, et cetera, can help us pri do that prior prioritizing. Yeah, it can. Yes, looking at the mis, uh, you know, when you when you, I think a lot of the information that the exciting part is not looking at how well you fit the data, but looking at the misfits and looking at the misfit structure, and that is going to be that misfit structure, is a combination of the data uncertainty and the model uncertainty, and we have to understand both. We need to work together to to isolate them and then you know, try to, um, improve how the. the our estimates of the uncertainty and reduce the uncertainties and understand the structure of it. And then there's another one. Have, oh, go ahead. Uh, I was just curious if you had a particular biogeochemical variable that bugs you with respect to uncertainty, like it's just, we needed to give you better, better uncertainty estimates. What, what's your favorite? Well, <laughs> I guess it's kind of a loaded question because obviously I'm gonna go with the optics. <laughs> the um it, the optics are um are something that I think we don't have a good uh basically uh operator for so we what we'd like to do is bring the model as close to the data as possible but we're at a level where lots of people are working with the optical data and the optical data is incredibly powerful because there's so much of it um thanks to satellites and and there's just it's such a great product but um, we need to understand the uncertainty structure of it, and it's you know, and, and it also has it doesn't have a Gaussian distribution. Right? We often assume as a long normal distribution, so it's just a different operator, different kind of measurement that I that the re it doesn't bug me, 
but what bugs me is that there's so much opportunity there that we're not taking great advantage of. And it's, it's kind of similar to things like ocean color as well, or I mean, I'm sorry, ocean sea surface temperature. It's sea surface temperature is, is something that there's a ton of the data. It's very powerful, but it's hard to know exactly how to model what the satellites are seeing and how, how to bring them into consistency. So uh, I think when it comes to something like the go BGC, the uncertainty structure in the oxygen or the nitrate or the pH is more straightforward to put into the assimilation and to, and to use those data. But the optical data, I feel like is, is something that we need to really prioritize uh, maximizing its utility and that we're, we're not using it to its, its fullest uh, potential. And Matt, I think you were about to touch on this last question. Do you want to maybe hit that in 60 seconds or less and then- Okay, 60 seconds up? or less. We, we, you can't, yes, obviously parameter estimation and, and is something that's really important. We talk about model, sources of model error, it's often the parameters and how do we estimate those parameters. If you have, the ocean has a lot of degrees of freedom. You can reduce those degrees of freedom uh, and, and make the problem tractable through parameterizations and there'll still be co coefficients in those parameterizations. And then you can use the data to try to determine those. Uh, so through data simulation uh, and you know, combining Go BGC with parameterizations, I think there's a lot of potential to understand what the parameter coefficients may be. And then through that, to understand how that relates to other things in the ocean, like, like mixing um, or, or just learn about the physics of the ocean and learning about these parameterizations. Great, thank you. So, um... I want to remind everyone to go watch the long versions of the talk and also to remind everyone that the discussion doesn't have to end here. We have two more days of workshop and also that's what the Slack channel was kind of designed for. But so that you can post your questions to the speakers when you think about them later this evening or tomorrow or next week. Um, and we can we can get back to you about those. Um, and so with that, I want to thank all the speakers again. People can come on the camera again and we're going to say thank you. That was some, a really great set of talks.